Thank you. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky. I'm Dean at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. And I also have the enormous privilege of this year being the president of the Association of American Law Schools. And it's really an enormous pleasure to welcome you. But I think is the first program that the LLS has done for lecturers and adjunct faculty. So I'm sure you know the Association of American Law School. It's a membership organization of law schools. It is a learned society for law schools. Part of this is doing conferences, both with regard to substantive law and pedagogy. Every January, there's a national conference of law professors and instructors, and key staff from law schools from around the country. There are conferences for clinical professors. There are conferences that are focused on entry-level faculty. There are conferences that are focused on faculty early and also later in their career. There are programs that are geared to deans. The executive committee of the DLS realized that one of the things that we didn't do was provide programs for lecturers and adjunct faculty. What you do as lecturers and adjunct faculty are so vital in every law school across the country. You bring essential practical experience to our students in our classrooms. You add enormously to the coverage in our curriculum, often providing specialized courses that our faculty can't do. You enrich us with all that you do for our schools. And so we're just delighted to be able to provide this program for lecturers and adjunct faculty. And I hope it's the first of many that we will do. I just wanna take a moment and express thanks to those who put this program together. I wanna to start by thanking my colleague, Professor Molly Van Howling, who chaired the planning committee. Molly spent the last seven years as the Associate Dean for Curriculum and Teaching at Berkeley Law, and has done so many wonderful programs, including for our lecturers and adjunct faculty. And so when the executive committee decided to have this program, it seemed just natural for me to reach out and yet once again impose on Molly to put together this program. And I'm also very grateful to all of the members of the planning committee, and you can see them in their, your program, and for taking time from their very busy schedules to be a part of this. I also want to thank Mary Cullen and everyone at the AALS putting on a program like this. It's an enormous effort, and I'm very grateful to them. Most of all, I'm appreciative to all of you who are spending your time today for this program. I hope it will be valuable. I learned a long time ago that no one comes to a program to hear the Dean's welcome or the double S President's welcome. So with that, I will turn it over to Molly, again, with thanks to her and all the planning committee and everyone at AALS. Thank you so much, Erwin, for your leadership at AALS and of course at our home of Berkeley Law. I thought I would start by telling the participants what you can expect today. We'll have three panels on preparing for your class, conducting class sessions, and assessing your students both during the course of the class and at the end of the semester. During the panels, you'll see some interaction between our moderators, who are my fellow members of the planning committee, and our panelists. And then at the end of all three panels, we've reserved time for interaction with you, audience Q&A. Now we know that some of you are brand new adjunct instructors and some of you are quite experienced. So we hope in the Q&A that you will not just ask your newbie cues, but also offer some of your own tips, things that you've learned over the years about best practices in law school pedagogy. Now, when the question and answer time comes, you may use the reaction button on your Zoom controls to raise your hand. And when I recognize you, Alexa from the AALS team will unmute you so you can give us your question. You may also use the chat function to submit questions. And Jim from the AALS team will be helping me to moderate the chat. Go ahead and use the chat at any time, although we will be answering those questions at the end of all three panels. Now, I wanna close my introduction with a preview of the substance of what we plan to impart today in the form of three learning outcomes that we hope to accomplish. First, we want everyone to finish today with a new or refreshed appreciation of the importance of planning to course design, delivery, and assessment. 
Second, we want you to learn new ways to really think about your students. And by that, we mean all of them, the stars as well as the stragglers. And to think of them during all three phases, course design, delivery, and assessment. And finally, we want to encourage you to prepare to model excellence for your students at every step in the teaching process. And by excellence, we don't mean perfection. We mean excellence sometimes in recovering from your mistakes as well. So to get underway with our first panel, I want to introduce our moderator and panelists. Ershka Valenconia from the Georgetown University Law Center is a member of the planning committee who will serve as the moderator for our panel on getting started preparing your class. She will be joined by panelists Fred Smith from Emory University School of Law and David Super also from Georgetown. Ershka, please take it away with our first panel. Thank you, Molly. It's a delight to be here. As Molly said, our first two panelists are Fred Smith from Emory and my colleague, David Super from Georgetown. Both of them are excellent teachers. Fred teaches con law in federal courts and has received Emory's most outstanding professor teaching award twice. And my colleague, David, is the last true legal polymath. He has taught pretty much every course that Georgetown offers from contracts to evidence to federal income tax. Like Fred, David recently received Georgetown's top teaching award. And what sets David apart is that he started teaching as an adjunct. Although he's been in academia for decades, about 30% of all classes he's ever taught, he's taught as an adjunct. The format for each of the three panels we'll have today will vary a little bit. Ours will be a moderated conversation with our two panelists. I'm going to ask them questions and, and follow up. Um, so the topic, as Molly said, for our first panel is preparing to teach a class things that you do before you step into the classroom. I also know we have a good mix of adjuncts here today, some new, some very experienced, some teaching large classes, many teaching smaller discussion and practice-based courses. And what we'll try to do in this conversation is to offer advice as well as, well as we can to all. So David and, and, and Fred, one thing required to teach each course is, is a syllabus. You're invited by a school to teach a class. And the first thing you typically need to do is to put together a syllabus. So I'll start with you, Fred, if I may. How do you go about designing a syllabus for like a stock course, such as federal courts or, or contracts when teaching it for the first time? Yeah, so when, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me and it's great to see you. Um, so the first step uh, when it comes to a, a class like the one that you're describing where there's going to be lots of syllabi out there from people who've done it before um, is to reach out to people who have taught the class. Um, so people in your networks and to look at a range of syllabi. Um, and that's going to go hand in hand with the textbook, right? So different folks are going to be using different textbooks. And so um, what you're going to also want to do is look at a number of textbooks to see um, which ones fit with uh, what you want to get across and how you teach the best. Um, so in my experience, students dis some often dislike textbooks that have so many notes and so many citations that they don't know what they're responsible for, right? So like, you know, you, you may read a book and you're like, oh, I love that it has all these cases from the lower courts and all these cases from, but students are like, wait, wait, do I need to know all of that, <laughs> right? And so um, so personally, I, I try to look for, um, you know, for relatively clean um, textbooks. Um, and that again is gonna go hand in hand uh, with the syllabus. Um, and then I kind of go through uh, to uh, to see, yeah, th this is about the right number of pages compared to what I wanted. What I want to teach is this covering the subjects. Where might I want to actually reverse things? The first time I teach, I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna actually do that much engineering necessarily because you learn a lot from the first time you teach a class and you end up changing it. So I keep a I keep a syllabus that I return to over the course of the semester with red lines <laughs> about what didn't work. <laughs> and then at the end, I, uh, I revisit it. Um, and unfortunately, I've had at one point, I had to revisit the whole case book <laughs> and, and, and turn to another one. Um, but you know, but, but, the, but that's, uh, that's my typical approach. Yeah, I did that too in my second year of teaching because the first year was the wrong textbook that didn't work. So, uh, try to avoid that mistake um, if we're on the list, like things not to do. Um, so David, I know you recently taught federal income tax for the first time. How did you go about 
figuring out what to do, what court, what case book to teach. Um, well, um, I, I agree with everything Fred said. For me, I, and I, as you suggest, I've had to pick a case book in quite a few different subjects that when first teaching them. Um, what I usually do is I pick a few cases or issues that I really care about or that I think a lot of people will do badly or what I think is badly, and I just compare the books on those. So for tax, I wanted to see how everyone did Eisner versus McComer and how everyone did Glenshaw Glass. I figured if you can do those well, you're probably a good book. And if you make a hash of them, I don't want to spend my semester apologizing for you. Um, well, the, the book I chose actually has does not teach Glenshaw Glass as a, as a main case, but as a note, but it does it really well. And, and, and that was all that was needed. So I was happy with it. In ad law, I looked for uh, Overton Park, uh, Chevron, um, notice and comment rule making something like chocolate manufacturers and sub APA policy making. And if they a book uh, can handle those, they probably are handling the rest of the stuff pretty well. Just it lets you do an apples to apples comparison. It lets you cut through the different presentational values of the books a lot. Uh, and I find that very helpful. Um, uh, as Fred said, when I teach something the first time, I mostly hijack somebody else's syllabus and make almost no changes to it. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I work through the syllabus over the summer and, and they get to something that I, oh, that's just going to make their head spin. I, I will plug, you know, swap something out. Um, but I, I have a very strong um, prejudice in favor of borrowing the syllabus. And, and obviously, I, I, I talk to people who've taught it before and try to get a sense about whether their approach to the course is similar to what mine will be, so that I'm not trying to uh, adopt uh, a... Uh, straight lecturers uh, syllabus when I'm a discussion oriented teacher, for example. That all makes a lot of sense. Okay, so what about when you're asked to teach a more specialized course? I know a lot of our adjuncts, certainly at Georgetown, they predominantly teach relatively small, highly specialized courses that they're asked to design, but oftentimes the course doesn't overlap perfectly with your area of expertise. That's true for full-time faculty as well as for adjunct faculty. So how do you craft a new syllabus? Um, how do you start with that process? And I'll start with David now first, if, if that's okay, just switch it up a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I think the key point with, with that, with, with readings there, is what do you want to do with them in class? It's not enough to have them just be great things to learn or cute things to look at. Everything you assign in a, in a seminar, you have to have an idea what you're going to do with. Are you going to have them re-argue the case and take sides? Are you going to ask how could counsel for this side or that side have done better? Are you going to give them hypotheticals twisting the facts uh, of the cases a little bit? But you need to do something with it. Um, and when you just put things out there for flat learning, the class ends up being pretty flat. Um, uh, so th that's what I do. The other thing, and, and it's painful to say, but it's true, every hour you spend editing stuff down will make for a better class. If you don't edit, you maybe can afford three, four, five items, and if those fall flat, which they might, you're, you're stranded. Um, but if you edit your stuff down aggressively and you can assign six, seven, eight items for a class, uh, without keeping the readings uh, out of control. Uh, if a few of them bomb, you can do more discussion on the others and you're still good. That sounds good. So, so Fred, how do you put together your specialized syllabi? How do you select the readings? How many pages do you assign? Does the number of pages vary depending on the type of reading? How do you even think about that? Yeah. So first, I just learned something. Like <laughs> on the um, the the they get in the six to to eight um, by by really uh, carefully editing down. I, I love that. Um, but uh, what what I do first, I make a list uh, of topics, um, and and then I, I try um, to match that list with the number of weeks that I have. Um, you know, so it may be that you know, that when I first make the list, there's there's too many of the things and I have to kind of bring things together. And then I try to see what fits together. Um, and I actually often will start there 
before I move to the readings to try to see what do we want, what are the topics I want to cover, what do I want them to, to learn and walk away with. Um, and uh, as David points out, I mean, a lot of that is going to be as it's going to be connected to what um, what their product is going to be. So I mean, when I've taught seminars, they're often writing a paper at the end. And so I want to expose them to, um, to enough uh, to kind of generate ideas for them uh, in terms of what might uh, what might inspire them and what they want to do a deeper dive into, um, and then um, what I do, at least what I've done in the past, is I've kind of picked a couple of pieces, um, maybe a few parts of an article plus a chapter of a book or one chapter of a book. Um, although after hearing David, I might actually amend this a little bit, um, and um, and then you know and, and and then work from there in terms of the number of pages. I mean, if, if if it's meeting once a week, um, you know, I, you know, to me, I think fifty to sixty um, is is very very reasonable. Um, but uh, but yeah, but other people might have different points of view about that. So we actually have some questions in the in the Q and A that are relevant on point. Is one of the uh, adjunct uh, Mark title asked, uh, should you find out who your students are before figuring out how much they know and assigning the readings? Um, I will tell you from my associate deaning experience in this is like, no, we approve courses based on a syllabus. Students then enroll. You might tweak your syllabus a little bit based on student interests, have a topic at the end of the course, maybe TB, TBD. But by and large, at least the way it works at Georgetown, the course is approved and the structure is approved, and it has to be all pretty packaged together. The risk of having the... Um, syllabus not be prepared at the beginning of the semester is that the course is going to go badly from the start and you as the instructor is going to be scrambling to find the readings and it's going to be a complete overload. Um, so David, one question given that we have adjuncts in this room, you've had plenty of lots and lots of work experience before you first taught a class. Do you into what, how do you incorporate that into a more sort of specialized class to make sure you're not just entertaining students with your war stories, but converting them into something that's educational? Um, I almost tell almost no stories. And uh, I, I have, I thought, I guess the course I've, I've adjuncted the most is the one that is, is actually is very much in my specialty area. And I've also thought as full-time faculty, um, but I don't tell any stories. Um, I, I've been assigned a few cases that I litigated, but I, I don't indicate that in the readings and unless they, are enterprising, they don't find out my involvement in them. I think it's a distraction. Um, I, I hope from these stories that I could tell I've learned stuff and I can, sometimes I build hypotheticals um, uh, I, um, about ethical issues that I faced or practice issues or, or strategy issues. Those things can be very helpful. Um, uh, and, and, and it does get a sense of the real world, but I, I don't put myself in it if for no other reason than because they're uncomfortable to say, you know, I think plaintiff's lawyer was really unethical in that case, if they know they're looking at plaintiff's lawyer. Um, and we've had some wonderful discussions. And then a week later, someone comes in, oh, that lawyer I was trashing in class, that was you. You know, but we had a good class discussion, so it was worth it. That is wonderful. I want to keep uh, keep talking about these topics, but we do have a limited amount of time. So another thing I would like to talk about, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll call on you, Fred, is one of the things we've discussed is, is, is establishing expectations, right? You prepare a class, you have certain expectations, students ultimately are going to be trying to conform to those expectations and ultimately be assessed based on those expectations. So when you're teaching a class, what are the expectations you establish? What do we expect from our students? How do we tell them, communicate clearly, what we expect from them. Sure. So I think it's important that the syllabus uh, communicate what the objectives are um, and what the assignments are going to be with some with as much specificity as you can. The, per, per, the percentage of their grade that each of those different components represents. Um, and uh, you know how much you know, how much does class participation matter, for example? Um, you know, how, you know, do you expect them to write uh, weekly response papers, et cetera, which by the way, for seminars, I think it's great, even if it's, if it's really short <laughs> um, to kind of keep folks engaged and have people thinking about the issues in advance. Um, so, uh, 
and, 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 and you know, you want to write a syllabus that's clear enough that almost every question that comes up during the course of the semester, that as you answer to the student, you can also direct them to the syllabus, right? You say, yeah, so yes, yeah, so as the syllabus notes, and you can literally quote the syllabus. It's like, oh yeah, and then the next time they'll they'll read the syllabus more carefully. Um, and 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 you want uh, a syllabus that communicates that, uh, you know, in a really clear um, way. We, I also received a question addressed directly to me, how to access syllabi if you're a newbie teacher. It obviously depends on the school. We have lots of adjuncts. What Georgetown has done is to connect the adjunct faculty will be working with someone on our staff. And then the staff will reach out to faculty who are teaching in that space and ask them nicely, would you please work with this adjunct, talk to them as they put together a syllabus. I know of one adjunct faculty member who spoke with eight different full-time faculty members as he was putting together his syllabus for um, corporate governance e on corporate governance ESG matters. This was happened in the last year. Um, so David, I know you have a, you've, you've given a lot of thinking on these questions about his expectations and what you do in the classroom. I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure I have that much to add to what Fred said. I think it's being super clear what you're looking for. Um, when I talk about class participation in my syllabus, I am very, very strong that I care about quality, not quantity, because if you don't emphasize quality, you will get a whole lot of quantity, much of it of low quality and much of it for filibusterers who raise their hand first to get called on and then try to backfill something to say, which is just not what you want. Um, so uh, I emphasize quality very much. Uh, I think I keep notes as I'm going along so that I don't get wowed by the last, what happens in the last two or three classes. And I'm transparent if people ask about my notes. I mean, I haven't really been hearing that much from you or no, I really like what you say, uh, or, you know, maybe a, a few more focused comments that, that then the, the, the large number that you've had would be better. Uh, I think it, if they're going to be graded on it, I should give them what information I have as we go along. So what David just said is, a, is something I hope people are paying attention to. So I will repeat what he just said is in a lot of discussion based courses, participation is a substantial portion of the grade. And what at least Georgetown has started doing, given how we have 500 classes each semester, is to start instructing adjunct faculty in particular, provide feedback throughout the semester, or at least once during the semester on participation if you're going to be taking participation into account so that the students can tweak, revisit, fix what they're doing. Okay, I want to make sure we have time to, one of the biggest topics since I've joined academia has been an increase in focus on inclusivity. I know the second panel is going to talk about classroom management, naming, and pronouns, but it's obviously a step before that as you're thinking about designing a class. How do you, have you changed how you design a class? with an eye towards making your classes more inclusive in both in terms of the selection of topics that you cover or the reading assignments, but also then how you, this is a follow-up I hope we can cover is, how do you encourage participation from students, some of whom you know ex ante are gonna be less likely to participate? Uh, Fred, can I call on you? Sure. Um, so yes, I mean, the one, I, mean, I do try to think about the, the materials that are being assigned um, and whether or not there's opportunities um, to include issues related to subordination, related to the reckoning, et cetera. And that's gonna look different from class to class in terms of, um, of, of how to, how to uh, include more of that. Um, but I do think about that. Um, and this, is relate, this can be related to the, um, the participation point. Um, so although I do think the syllabus should be very clear and virtually every reading should be identified in advance, sometimes I will have one <laughs> where it, and it'll be something like, you know, you will read a preliminary uh, injunction order that day, you know, um, and I'll poll them on a list of topics. Um, because it, because I'm just, because all that matters is that they know the standard. And so, it'll, you know, and there'll be a list, you know, voting rights or, you know, excessive force, et cetera. And then, you know, I find a good uh, preliminary injunction order that matches up against that. Um, and try, in terms of trying to keep everybody engaged, I do a lot of, 
um, a polling during the class itself. So, you know, if you think the answer is A, raise your hand. If you, you know, when there's clickers, it's even better because people can be anonymous. Um, Zoom is actually great for this. Like, this is the one thing I miss about Zoom uh, is how great the uh, the poll function was. Um, and and that's a way, you know, and that's a way to really kind of make sure that everyone is consistently paying attention, but you're also testing yourself at that point. Um, because if you ask a question and there is a right answer and, you know, and 30% get it wrong, then it's a test, it's a, it's a sign. Okay, we got we need to spend some more time on this and I'll return to that same hypothetical later in the semester. Um, and, uh, and hopefully way more hands will go up on the right answer. Hey, uh, David, I'd love to hear from you too. Yeah, I mean, I found that in, as Fred said, in some course you've got a lot more flexibility than others, but there's a lot of topics we teach sort of by default or by tradition in cases which, if you'll excuse me, involve squabbling, uh, affluent, straight, cis, white guys. Um, and there's actually good as good or better cases that uh, cover, that, that show things uh, more about the whole um, uh, diversity of the country. For example, if you're going to be teaching a case about construing contracts against the drafter, how about a case involving Native Americans negotiating contracting with the United States government? If you're going to be talking about a fraud case, how about a case about slick operators trying to separate um, freed formerly enslaved people from their land? Um, and I found, uh, I mean, it, it takes some work to find them, but over time, swapping in some of these cases for some of the cases that are mostly pretty boring, um, that are in the standard curriculum, uh, I think affects students a lot more. I use slides in my, um, uh, prepare slides for all my classes, and I'm very conscious, although the clip art selection is very, very white, to um, pull what I can to have uh, as many of the characters be diverse as possible in that. And uh, in that sense, a message that I think is valuable. I've also learned that Facebook groups can be very harsh on volunteers, uh, particularly women and students of color. And a lot of them feel like they will be attacked if they volunteer. Um, and so I cold call, even in courses where you would think maybe I shouldn't, because that may be the only place that I don't hear the loudmouths, and usually the loudmouths do not have a monopoly on wisdom. So Fred, do you cold call? Uh, I typically don't. Uh, I, I try to rely on volunteers. That said, um, I constantly forward over them the threat of cold calling if if uh, if I'm hearing from so if I hear from one person if I hear from someone I'm not going to call on them again that class and if I you know I try to well I do I say if I don't hear from new voices um then I'm going to cold call only rarely have I had to resort to it um and when I have resorted to it what I've done is I've made lists where people know that it's kind of their day that they're the that they're the backup that day um, which kind of gives them a little bit of comfort. Um, and so you would, you know, in, in that sense, I've had, you know, I have to ad adjust, um, but they know in advance that that adjustment might happen if I'm not hearing from everyone. Okay, we're, we're basically out of time. So I would like from each of you, like things not to do, one or two. Uh, David. Uh, don't do what you think is the right thing to do. Do what you can do best. It's better to do the third best thing well than the best thing badly. That's awesome. I should put this on my wall. I'm serious. Uh, Fred? Uh, when it comes to assessment in particular, what you say in the beginning, you got to stick to it. Um, it's super important. Okay. Thank you both so much. I wish we could carry on, but he, we have a bunch of very interesting speakers that I look forward to hearing to, uh, from as well. Thanks, David and Fred. Ershka, Fred, David, thank you so much. I feel like we are making great progress on our learning objectives in terms of the importance of planning, of listening to your students, including designing thoughtful participation techniques to make sure you have the opportunity to listen to all of your students, not just the loudmouths, as David put it. And in terms of modeling excellence, I think that Ershka and David and Fred have done that for all of us with their presentation and describing their really thoughtful approach to teaching. 
we've started to get some teasers about our next topic, which is how to implement all of your good planning with excellent classroom sessions. And that will be the focus of our next panel. It will be chaired by Philip Genty, who is a faculty member at Columbia Law and also Vice Dean. Mushtaq Ganja is Chief of Staff and Vice President at the American Council on Education, as well as being an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown. Bert Huang is on the faculty at Columbia Law School. And Andrea Roth is my colleague at UC Berkeley. Philip, take it away in moderating this next panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, good day to all of you. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to everyone at uh, the AALS, uh, to Dean Ch uh, Chemerinsky, and especially to our leader, uh, Professor Molly Van Howling, who uh, uh, for her tireless work and uh, in organizing and frankly hurting all of us uh, in, in putting this together. Um, our second panel uh, on, on teaching will follow nicely, I think, from the first, because we're going to continue to draw on the uh, learning objective themes that uh, Molly outlined at, uh, at the beginning of, of the session. And I want to start, before turning things over to the panelists, by acknowledging that those of you who are attending today's workshop teach a variety of, of different courses in, 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 in different settings, right? Experiential offerings, seminars, and large doctrinal classes. So it may seem that you have little in common and that there's not a lot we could do that would, uh, that would uh, uh, connect all of you and apply to all of you. But I hope this panel will illustrate that the similarities among these uh, different types of courses actually outweigh the differences. Because regardless of the course model or the course size, um, it's absolutely essential to think carefully about our goals, our goals for the course as a whole and for each class. Uh, and we also need to think about how each class serves our larger goals for the course. What work is this particular class doing? And, and this is true even if you're teaching a class uh, that uh, you know is a is a standard class that uh, that has been taught by other people. You need to make it your own, and you need to really think about 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 your own goals. And 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 as I say, the work, uh, the way these classes fit together, and kind of what the uh, how, how one class will lead to another, how one class will, uh, will set up the classes that follow. Um, and once we define the goals, then we need to think about the teaching content and the techniques that will best achieve those goals. So we have three wonderful panelists today. Uh, they are all celebrated teachers within their uh, own institutions, you have their biographies, they've won uh, a, a bunch of teaching awards uh, and are of course uh, have been uh, wonderful institutional citizens in, in, uh, in helping uh, uh, their, their colleagues with the enterprise of teaching. They have a wealth of experiences and ideas and, uh, and they've, uh, they've all taught in both uh, large and small class settings. So we hope that um, as you listen to them, you'll be able to adapt their ideas to your own teaching and that the approaches each of them describes uh, will inspire your own creativity. You may say, oh, that person is different from, me. I, you know, I don't think I could do what that person is describing, but hopefully the idea itself will inspire you to say, well, but actually there's something that I could do that, that might be kind of interesting and that, that would, that would uh, achieve some of the goals that the speaker has described. The other thing I wanna say about our panelists that I've, uh, I've uh, learned from, from, uh, from working with them as we put this together is that they're humble and, and, and reflective. That is, even though they have uh, uh, been recognized as excellent teachers, they all are constantly thinking about what they could do better and, 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 and reflecting on that. And I think that's one of the keys to effective teaching is never feeling that you have it figured out, that, 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 you, can, that you can always improve and you can always learn from others. So you'll be hearing first 
from uh, Mashtak Gunja, followed by my friend and Columbia colleague, Bert Huang, and concluding with Andrea Roth. So I'm going to turn the Zoom screen over now to, uh, to Mashtak, who, like you, manages to balance a very demanding day job uh, with uh, extremely successful adjunct teaching. Mashtak. Thanks, Philip. And uh, I am I'm honored to be here, happy to be here. I already learned a ton from Fred and David about course design and syllabi. And uh, Fred and David, if you don't mind, I'm going to steal uh, a couple of things that I learned. I think that's really all we ever do as professors is just take what's already sort of worked for somebody else and take it up. Um, as Philip said, I am an adjunct. I do have a full-time job. I practiced um, law for about 10 years, mostly as a federal prosecutor. I'm now uh, in the uh, I'm at the American Council on Education, uh, so now do higher ed policy work. I do teach as an adjunct at Georgetown. I teach evidence um, often, first year CRIM uh, occasionally, uh, just finished a uh, first year CRIM class this summer, and then teach sort of some various seminars on CRIM topics. I was hoping to talk a little bit about how I, I approached my first class, but I thought I might make a few observations um, first that explains sort of why I approach the class that way. Um, and I thought I would sort of break them up into two sort of topics. One sort of what it's like to be an adjunct and then um, second sort of what I see in the, the students in our, in our classes these days. First, um, you know, Philip sort of mentioned balancing um, full-time work with, with teaching and uh, it's hard um, as all of you have done it before now and all of you who are about to do it are, are going to find out, you know, and it's a huge responsibility, really. I mean, students come to this, come to law school, um, and it's it's expensive, it's really important to them, and, you know, classes are really, really important. I would, um, as you think about balancing work and teaching, uh, especially the first time, I would not underestimate the amount of time it is going to take to teach and to teach well, especially when you consider office hours and, you know, writing exams and reading papers and then the grading of the exams afterwards, you know, letters of rec, all of that stuff just takes more time than I sometimes think that it will, you know, and I guess my, my, my one piece of advice is, you know, to the extent that you can prepare in advance, I would do that. I mean, once the semester starts, it gets really busy. I mean, I would have not just your syllabi ready. I mean, obviously you need to do that, but as many and as much of the course sort of lectures or plans done in advance. Um, the thing to know too, is that it gets way easier. I mean, so much easier. Like the, the second time you teach a class, you know, it's like 50% as much work and the fourth or fifth time you teach it, it's like a lot less work. It's gonna be great, but it's gonna be a lot in the beginning. And I, I know you all know that, but just sort of do as much as you can in advance of class. Second thing I might say about being an adjunct, it is this tricky balance, I think, of expertise versus sort of war stories, right? I mean, you were all chosen to teach because you have super valuable experience. Um, it's also the case that often students are not going to necessarily know that you're an adjunct. I mean, this is just a class for them, right? And, um, and so you need to teach it in some ways as you would teach another class. I sometimes think of this balance of like, you know, experience and bringing that to the classroom versus war stories by sort of thinking about answering questions um, or sometimes presenting the material as sort of what happens generally versus what has happened to me. Like I try not to personalize the my stories very much, but I do think it's sometimes helpful for students to know, you know, this is the sort of piece of evidence that is likely to get in in any given trial. And this is a piece that is not. Um, but I try as much as I can to keep make it not as much about me. I don't think I've ever hit that right balance, but I think that it's a balance I'm, I'm constantly sort of thinking about. And then last thing I might say about sort of being an adjunct, um, you know, I, I really lean into it, I think, with my students um, and try to use it a little bit to my advantage, right? I, I'm an adjunct. I'm not going to know everything. I don't pretend to know everything with my students, everything about the law, everything about practice, but certainly everything about the law. And I'm pretty upfront with them about that. And I think it gives, it buys me a little bit of space and grace to say, 
I don't know, but I will find out. You know, I've never had a student sort of complain that I wasn't able to answer a question immediately. And I think that that's good, right? I think it's it, it lowers the stakes and pressure. Um, speaking of students, a couple of observations about the students I see. Um, they are smart, so smart. Um, I mean, so much smarter than I feel like I was and, and we were when we were going through. Um, but they don't always know it. Um, and I think sort of pulling that out is, is important. Second thing I'd say, um, and I don't know how, how all of you have felt about this, but it feels to me like a particularly anxious group of students right now. They're nervous about whether they can do it. They're nervous about grades. They're nervous about exams. COVID, I'm certain, has not helped. Rising student debt has not helped. Um, and then the third thing I guess I might say is, you know, they seem, especially in this new COVID world, to be seeking community. And I, I think um, those are the things I'm a little bit trying to solve for in the class and a little bit trying to solve for in that first class, right? I'm trying to solve for um, sort of revealing how smart they are, thinking through how to resolve some of their anxiety and thinking through how we might be able to build a community, right? And I'm also trying to solve for, look, I'm an adjunct, but this is a serious class. I'm taking it seriously. I want them to be sort of taking it seriously. Um, so a couple of thoughts on the first class um, as I approach it. I find those first five minutes incredibly important. Um, students make up their minds about how they're gonna feel and approach a class like really early. Um, it's also the time when anxiety is highest. They don't know what to expect. Um, and I think you can earn a tremendous amount of goodwill early. Like if you're gonna grab that cup of coffee, make sure the caffeine like kicks in for those first five minutes, because I think, I mean, I, I feel like you can win those students over like right away if you can. Um, I also try to show and tell them about what they can expect in the class, right? So I show it by engaging in all of the things that we're, we're typically going to do over the 13 weeks, you know, in that first class. And I tell them a little bit about the process and substance of the class. And I mostly do it in the frame of thinking about having them think about whether this class is for them, right? Most of us are teaching electives, um, so students can choose whether or not to take it. Um, and so I try to make it clear that, you know, I've made some choices in designing this class in this particular way, and I want them to make some choices about whether they should take it or not, right? So I'm really explicit about the fact that I've made choices about why this book, right? Why these substantive topics, why this mode of discussion, like why I pick the exam format that I do, right? Why we're gonna do sort of class discussion in the way that I want. And then I ask them to think about whether this is the right class for them. So in evidence, for example, you know, I, um, I tell them all the ways in which my class is theoretically a little different than somebody else's, right? So. Um, I do cold calling and I do it in a particular way. Um, I don't do, I don't assign a lot of cases. It's really much more of a problem focus, right? I don't cover sexual assault. I do lots of like topical readings. Like I tell them all the ways in which this class might be a little bit different, tell them. And then I ask them at the end to sort of think, you know, is this the class for you? If not, no hard feelings. I'm not gonna be upset, right? But I want them to take like a little bit of ownership of their decisions. And I think um, that really helps. Um, it helps for all of us to sort of be on the same page about what we are trying to accomplish. And then um, I also try, as I said a second ago, to do all of the things over the course of the year that we're going to do in that first session. Um, so I ask them to do a small reflection exercise, small group discussions, right? We, um, I try to divide the class up into prosecution and defense and ask them to sort of start um, arguing. And, and this is, you know, I, I break them up into small groups to build community. I try to divide the class up into prosecution and defense to help sort of reveal how smart they are. I do a little bit of cold calling in that first class um, and try to be especially gentle, right? To try to reduce anxiety a little bit. And then I always will start class with some videos just because, and mostly The Office or Seinfeld or something like that, just to show that we're gonna have a little bit of fun, um, hopefully a lot of fun over the course of the year. Um, and I do think last thing I might say, right? Make that first class fun, you know, lean into it. I, I think it really sets the tone. Actually, actually last thing. Um, I am nervous every single time I teach. I'm nervous all the time. I'm just a nervous person, but I'm always nervous that first class, right? Um, and I. I think that's okay. And I tell my students that I'm nervous and I know that they might be too. And I think, again, it like serves to like lessen anxiety a little bit and to help build a little bit of community. I've talked way too long, Philip. I'm so sorry. I tried to talk fast. I'm gonna kick it back to you. 
No, thank you, much talk. And, and I, I, the other thing I was going to say is just, I think most of what you talked about w uh, works both for the seminar and for the large classes, right? So I think that's right. I do the same thing in both, in both my seminars and my larger classes. Great. Well, thank you very much. So Bert, you're up now. Hi, thank you. Thank you all. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to get to share my thoughts. Following up on um, Mushtaq's wisdom about the first class and setting um, expectations and also setting good first impressions, uh, I thought it might be interesting or maybe even useful for you to hear it just a little bit more in depth about one particular illustration of, um, of something that, that I've done in class, an exercise that I use uh, on the first day of uh, any class that I teach, especially for their first year students. So here's how it goes. Imagine that you're a first year student where you're a student in law school and you're showing up for class on that first day. You're nervous. You're looking to build community. Maybe you want to show how smart you are. You've done the prep, done the readings. You're well prepared, but you're a little nervous. You're bracing yourself for the cold call. It's not a great feeling. You kind of know how law school classes go. You're not especially excited about walking into the classroom either. So you find your seat, you sit down. The professor introduces herself. You think we're gonna start talking about the cases, but instead the first thing that you see on the board is what looks like a poem. And it looks like kind of old-ish English, maybe Shakespearean. It's not in the readings. You don't know what, what this is, why the professor has put it up. And she calls on somebody in the class to read it aloud. And soon you and your classmates are puzzling over together, what could this thing possibly mean? This bit of gibberish that looks a little bit like English. Before long, you're all kind of pitching in. It's pretty low stakes. It's not, it's not law stuff. There's it's not in the readings. It's not gonna be on the exam. Before too long, the professor hands out more of this passage. And it turns out it's a play. And it is probably Shakespeare at this point. In fact, it's got the word Romeo in it. <laughs> you realize, oh, you think, you think you know the story. And now you're gonna, your classmates are all puzzling over it together, piecing it together, trying to fit it into the overall story, which you think you know, but maybe you don't. Then the professor hands out a full excerpt and assigns parts and everybody reads a part and it becomes very clear to you what's happening, at least in this scene, but you can still puzzle over where this fits into the overall story. At that point, everyone's having Kind of a nice time just reading this thing it's not law school it's so different um maybe you didn't have anything to say about the case you read for the assignment but you have something to say about you know the prince of verona's motivations here you can speculate why not there's no right answer and then the professor calls it and instead she turns you to a discussion of why did we just do this exercise on the first day of class what was the point Pretty quickly, you and your classmates, you know, figure out, look, this is a metaphor for reading, maybe reading opinions or puzzling over texts. It looks like gibberish, but it's, maybe it's English. I don't know. Let's figure out what it means. What are people's motivations? Okay, sure, you get all that. The professor then leads you down a little bit further into thinking through what it is doing as a moment of pedagogy in the class, how it is setting the tone for the class, how it is about the classroom as a form of collaborative theater where everyone's kind of playing a part. They're reading out lines. They're kind of workshopping lines. They're not speaking in their own voice. You're making counter arguments or arguments in class or criticizing an opinion or defending an opinion that you've read. You won't be necessarily presenting your own views, but taking on a role. Um, you realize soon that the professor has gotten everyone to uh, speak up or at least see other people speak up in a very low stakes, more relaxed way. And then you move on to talking about the syllabus and actually what's going to happen throughout the rest of the course. But you do already have a sense of what's going to happen through the rest of the course because you've seen sort of this idealized model of it um, at play uh, through this little exercise. All right, so that's what the student experience is like. For you as the teacher, um, you know, or for me as a teacher when I do this, um, I think a couple of other things happen. I think it lowers the blood pressure in the room. I think it gives that sense of possible fun that Mishtaq was emphasizing. I think that it helps break the silence. It helps more voices show up in the classroom just from the very first moments um, that are not in the form of a cold call. Um, and I think importantly for you, and maybe especially importantly as an adjunct, it shows the students, that it would show the students something like this would show the students that you have a plan, that you've thought it through, 
that you've constructed a lesson plan for the course that has a point also, right? That's part of the reflection um, exercise. Uh, the point of that is, is to show that there is a point to the whole exercise. So um, this is one possibility. It's one thing that I do. I know that it's limited perhaps an application to um, one else who are especially receptive to this sort of thing. But you can easily imagine variations on this uh, working for a seminar, maybe for upper class students, where you're reading a transcript of that deposition or a trial transcript or arguments or you know, a screenplay that on a topic that's related um, from a movie that's, that's related to the course. So um, it's just a bit of a jog to your imaginations. Uh, but again, you know, keeping in mind the sort of things that uh, Mushtaq was emphasizing and also Molly has been emphasizing as sort of the major themes for today, thinking about modeling for your students, now you, there's just models sort of a form of participation that you're uh, hoping that they will carry forward into the rest of the course when it's not a little excerpt from Shakespeare. Um, this idea of, um, of having a plan, right? showing that you know, everything that you do in this course is gonna have a point. There's a reason that you're doing it. Um, and this idea of sort of just excellence in preparation and you're showing them that you're just as prepared as you expect them to be. So um, uh, I'm happy to talk about this more or other possibilities, um, but I'll turn it back to you, Philip, at this point. Thank you, Bert. Let me just ask you one follow-up. Um, I know, because I know you well, that you take on very hard, difficult subject matter in the courses that you teach. You don't shy away from that. Do you think that this kind of an exercise helps, helps make those conversations less charged because of sort of introducing the idea of the role that everybody is playing in the classroom? I think it's possible. I think that can be one benefit of having this sort of idea of the classroom as kind of a theater or collaborative theater or it's exercise, uh, this, this sort of have this exercise right up front because uh, as you're suggesting, uh, students are less likely to attribute something that someone says when the professor asks them to say it. Uh, you know, make this argument or make the counter argument, which is against everything you believe, but you have to try to make that argument. Students are less going to be inclined to attribute that to the students, the speaker's view, own views, rather than recognizing um, that this is a part of this theater that we're all engaged in. So thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Great, thank you, Bert. Um, Andrea. Hi, um, I'm going to go, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, um, and I'm going to go pretty concrete really quickly by going through some slides that have some tips. Um, I'm going to speak quickly, but um, I will definitely share the slides afterwards and happy to talk more about anything. Um, so let me know if um, this uh, doesn't work. But otherwise, I will assume that it is working. Um, so I'll have just four quick tips. Uh, and then I have a, a note on war stories and um, the, the beauty uh, and critical nature of uh, adjunct teaching for students. Um, so tip number one uh, is to uh, know your students. And we've talked about this before, but um, just wanted to point out um, and by the way, you know, half of what I've learned, I've learned from my colleague, Molly Van Howling, Schaefer Van Howling. So um, as much like said, I'm stealing all of this from other people. Um, we have a student information sheet. I ask for pronouns. How do you pronounce your name? Uh, where did you grow up? Um, I don't ask where did you go to college so that the, you know, I went to a big state school and it was great. So I don't, but I do want to know, you know, do you have a math and science background? Do you have a uh, political science background? Um, you know, did you travel for five years? Um, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a prosecutor? Uh, look, only one person out of 100 wants to be a prosecutor. That's helpful to know when I'm thinking about how to create viewpoint diversity in the classroom. Um, anyway, this also helps you to um, relate to your students when they're on call. I actually, when I go to my roster photos, I put one or two key facts next to them, like, um, you know, knows jujitsu future immigration lawyer or something. And so when that person's on call, I can say, you know, I, you mentioned you're inter interested in immigration work. Let me ask you a particular question about blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, they're so amazed that you can make this connection with them. And uh, I know it's hard in a big class. And I know 
that you are not getting compensated uh, <laughs> at a rate that, that makes sense for doing this type of detail, but it makes it so much more fun to teach. And you just get a lot of bang for your buck in learning your, your students' names and knowing this stuff about them. Okay, tip number two, get them talking. Uh, as um, I think Bert was saying with, with the wonderful exercise he does, you know, at the end of the day, one of the amazing things is they were all opening their mouths and speaking. And so not only does that wake them up and let the caffeine kick in, but it also means that the most shy person in the whole room who would be so afraid to volunteer by raising their hand has actually spoken to their neighbor about the question you raised. Um, everybody has said something. And that, I think that's hugely important. Um, so here's an example of like, you know, first day of evidence class, I put these two things up on the board and I have everybody talk to each other in groups of three or four about these questions. Everybody should be talking to somebody. Um, and then afterwards I go to various groups and it's less threatening because everybody's been talking about something. They've got something to say. Um, and uh, it's beautiful. And at the end of this exercise, they themselves have intuited the themes of the course. They're the ones who have come up with the fact that the main systemic values underlying evidence law are this, this, and this, and you can help them get there. Um, but it's beautiful because they've done the work. Then you can say, see how intuitive this is. You all came up with this. Um, uh, you could be teaching this class, you know? Uh, so I, and it also helps you get your sea legs back. Uh, as Mushtaq said, you know, he's an anxious teacher. Oh my gosh, I'm an anxious teacher. Every day I go in there and I just, you know, thank goodness that I've got this like minute and a half where they're talking to each other and I can just get my, you know, act together, so to speak. Uh, and so it's lovely to have that time. Okay. Um, I also sometimes do something a little bit more concrete. Like, you know, when I talk about attempt in criminal law, I'll actually list these steps and say, okay, talk to your neighbor. When would you call this an attempt? When would, do you think this should be prosecuted as an attempt? And the beautiful questions are the ones where you think there's gonna be some disagreement among the groups and goodness is there disagreement among the groups with this type of question. Um, so uh, it just gets everybody talking. Uh, it lets them see that it's not really intuitive where to draw the line. And uh, then they can say, oh, isn't it interesting that this state draws the line here and this state draws the line at a very different place. Um, okay. Strategic cold calling and seeking volunteers. Um, cold calling is scary. I do it for all the reasons that other previous speakers have, have talked about. These would be my tips. Number one, explain on the syllabus why you're doing it. I say, my goal is to diversify and liven up class, give you an opportunity to share your thoughts, blah, 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 not to intimidate or humiliate anyone so that they see that it's a tool of inclusivity um, and not the opposite. Uh, you know, my system is at the beginning of class, I'm putting four names on the board. So they're not deer in the headlights. When I talk, when I ask them a question, they've got some notice um, and also their co-counsel. And so it's less threatening. I can say, you know, if you don't know, call your co-counsel, you know, you're a team, you're a team. Uh, and they seem to like that. You got to make it fun. If you're going to have them not hate cold calling, you got to put your money where your mouth is and make it fun. So how do you make it fun? One of the things I like to do is, um, you know, not like, you know, do you think that the force requirement should be removed for sexual assault uh, so that you can get canceled on Facebook for whatever your answer is? No, I'm not going to ask that. But you can get students to articulate arguments by asking them descriptive questions like, well, which factor do you think the defense is going to have the hardest time with here? You know, ask a, a, a difficult but uh, you know, non-threatening question about the material. You know, what might be one social cost to eliminating the force requirement? I'm not saying you agree with it. I'm just saying, like, what you know, maybe they would increase false accusations and make it easier to to prove something um, against a, a group that is disproportionately prosecuted for this offense. You know, whatever. Why isn't but for causation enough to prove you caused a death? Um, uh, these are concrete enough, but also non-threatening. Don't be afraid to ask why several times in a row. So, you know, um, uh, you know, why wouldn't this be a crime? Because it's a thought crime. Well, why don't we prosecute thoughts? Well, because there are private thoughts. Well, why, 
is our, why are our private thoughts off limits to criminal law? You know, why, why, why? And it eventually gets to the core and then they've said something really profound. And then the beauty is that you can then remember that. I have a Google doc open at all times where I write down the student who said, especially if it's a shy or, or underconfident student, I write in the Google doc, you know, Andrea said, blah, blah, blah. And then later, two classes later, or in the review for the next class, I say, and as Andrea pointed out, da, 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 da. and Andrea, the, the super shy student is like, I can't believe Roth remembered what I said. Now everybody thinks I'm smart. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I get a lot of bang for the buck in remembering what people said. If they make a mistake, it's really important, obviously, to say when they make a mistake, but go back through the legal rule steps. So if, you know, is this hearsay? Um, yes. Okay. No, it wasn't. Okay. Let's go back. Um, instead of saying, no, eh, you're wrong. I'll say, well, let's back up. Uh, you know, you get the 3 a.m. call. What's hearsay? Out of court assertion offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. Is this out of court? Yes. You know, the student knows the legal steps and then eventually they're the ones who've gotten to the right answer. And in the meantime, you've solidified the legal rule for everybody in the room. So uh, yeah. And then remember what they say, I like to use ridiculous hypotheticals as fun starting points. So for example, I'll put something like this up. Whoever wishes a person to be dead is guilty of the crime of intended murder, punishable by up to 10 years. Later. And so I'll say to the person on call, you know, what do you think? Does this seem fair to you? No. Um, uh, uh, and Great. Doesn't seem fair to me either, Andrea. Um, so all of a sudden they're less threatened because they're like, okay, whew, I got you know something. I got something right. So let's figure. You know why? Why does it seem unfair to you? Well, because it seems like it's punishing a thought crime. And then you go down that road. So it's really fun. You're making it fun, or you know, as fun as evidence law can be. A um, couple of volunteer tips. We've heard this before, but you got to wait. I hate awkward silences, but I've learned that they aren't fatal. And you just sit there and you wait until the all the gunners and the usual suspects stop. And it's very clear that you're waiting for somebody to say something. Um, I even say explicitly, how about, how about um, someone we haven't heard from in a while? And you might think that that makes them embarrassed to, to raise their hand. It, for some reason, it doesn't. Eventually, they really appreciate it, and somebody you haven't heard from for a while will raise their hand. Um, remember what they say, uh, especially with seminars, um, but but also the big classes. You might get some stares if your question is too easy or too vague. So, so what do you all think? Stares. Um, you know, is this an out of court statement? It's too easy, and they're worried if I get it wrong, it's going to be super embarrassing, and if I get it right, I don't get any credit because it's too easy. So instead, you know, uh, you might say, well, what would be a viable defense theory here? You know, concrete, complex, you're going to get more hands. Let them know they're right first. So what, one other thing I like to do is put up a multiple choice question and have them self-assess. And then the beauty of this is you can just figure it out right before. Sometimes I write these things 10 minutes before class, okay? I don't worry about the web polling and all this fancy tech stuff. I just stick this up there. And then we go through it together. And then I say, okay, somebody who thought that, you know, uh, B was the right answer, why? Why do you think B was the right answer? And so you get the volunteer because they already know they got the right answer. So they're not gonna be that afraid to raise their hand. It's also a chance for some humor. Uh, there's no reason to go into the weeds on this, but like you can, you can put in like distractor fun questions that are obvious jokes. Okay, um, review, this is the last thing I'll say. Um, I review at the beginning of every class. I have a little takeaway slide. There's a lot of text, but I think um, I've, I've gotten good feedback about it. Um, whenever I've called these learning objectives, students freak out. They think, oh God, these are the objectives and I'm in, if I'm not meeting these objectives, I'm failing. So I've just started to call them takeaways, but they're essentially learning objectives, <laughs> okay? Um, and the other review tips, you know, I tend to spend too much time on review. I get this in my evaluation. So it's something I struggle with. So don't take too much time, um, even though I do, yikes. Um, then I pause for questions. And instead of saying, 
any questions because then the gunner is going to say something that goes down a rabbit hole. I'll just say any burning clarifying questions that would be helpful to talk about now. And then if there's none, that's great. Um, review is good for students. It solidifies points. It situates the discussion for the day in the previous material. It lets you get your sea legs back. Um, oh, it, and it lets you use people's names. You know, as, as Andre told us last week, you know, one other aspect of this is blah, blah, blah. It's good for the teacher because you can get your act together. You can deal with corrections. This is, you know, if you made a mistake the day before, instead of saying, I got it, I, I made a boo-boo, everybody. You can, you know, the beauty of the carpenter is, you know, in, in correcting them, in, in glossing over their mistakes, right? So this point might've gotten a little bit buried yesterday, but I wanted to clarify that blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's on your review slide. You, you haven't apologized. Okay, last thing I'll say, random note on war stories. Um, I think the reason that war stories can be helpful is if they are targeted and, and precise. And so for example, if the point I'm making is that the reason we have a hearsay exception for prior identifications is that it would be ridiculous to let in in-court identifications that are right, wildly suggestive, but not let in these prior identifications, I will use a war story involving an actual court proceeding where somebody points at a person in a black in an orange jumpsuit, a black man in an orange jumpsuit and says, that's the person I sold drugs to. And it turns out they brought the wrong man out from the holding cell. Um, and there's a huge gasp in the classroom. They're gonna remember that and they're gonna understand why 801D says what it says. And so it's not just a war story, it's a war story that has a very clear takeaway related to the doctrine. Okay, I'll shut up now, thanks. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, back to you, Molly. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Philip and team. Reflecting back on our learning objectives, the things we want you to take away uh, at the end of our session today, we said one is for you to think about modeling excellence to your students. And I just want to observe based on that last panel, how part of modeling excellence is modeling humanity. We heard so much about knowing your students, listening to your students, taking their blood pressure down and making things fun. And um, I, I found that very valuable from our last panel. So thank you all very much. We are now on to our final panel of the day, and it is about assessments. And that might seem fitting because I think we often think about assessments as something that happens at the end of the class, like the final exam. But we've already heard that from our perspective as instructors, assessments don't start at the end of the class. They start when you're planning the class. Fred said you have to stick to what you say in your syllabus about what you're going to cover and what you're going to assess students on at the end. So the planning for assessments starts at the beginning. And it turns out the assessments themselves can start at the beginning as well as soon as day one, when you pose questions to your students that help them assess their understanding and help you assess their understanding and thereby assess how well you are teaching. That's a tip that we heard from Fred as well. But we're really gonna dig into this topic of formative assessments, the ones that happen along the way, and summative assessments, the ones that happen at the end, and how starting from the beginning of our planning process, we can set out to succeed with all of these. And on these topics, first, we're going to hear from Cynthia Ho from Loyola University Chicago Law School. She is going to focus her remarks on the formative assessment part and how they fit into the bigger picture. And then we'll hear from Chris Franklin at New York Law School, where she is both a professor and director of the Academic Initiatives Program about writing and grading final exams. And there, too, how we start our planning for that from the very beginning of our class. Thank you both in advance, and Cynthia, take it away. Okay. Um, assume you guys can see my slides. Okay. Um, so just to let you know, I still have two screens back from when I was teaching online for a whole year. So if I'm looking left, it's because that's where my slides are. Um, so as Molly said, uh, I'm going to be focusing on formative assessment, which in my mind is a fancy word for feedback before the final. Um, and as she noted, we have a bunch of topics for this session. Let's see, I'm trying to go. Oh. Um, 
So I'll talk about formative and then Chris will talk about summative and we're also gonna sprinkle in a bit about how these tie with grading for each of these and student evaluations. Um, in case it helps, I thought it'd be a good place to start in terms of what are the distinguishing things between formative and summative assessment. So I have some graphics that I hope are helpful in terms of formative is about the learning process. And that's why I've got um, those arrows. So it's not like a one-time thing throughout the class, the whole semester, the goal is you're constantly trying to give feedback so they can learn from that. So that by the time they take the final, i.e. the summative assessment, um, the conclusion, and that's what the checkers are for, uh, we can hopefully have made more progress than if we didn't give them the formative assessment. Um, two other images that you might find helpful. Sometimes we think of formative assessment as low stakes. My students might disagree that the sloth is, is a little beyond low stakes, but just in contrast, summative assessment, if you had, for example, one final, that would be huge high stakes and a lot of stress for students. So the idea is if we build in a lot of formative assessments, that's less stressful to student and they'll learn. Now, I've already said that there are benefits. We also technically, not technically, we do all have to provide formative assessments according to the ABA since 2014. Um, and this is good for the students and for us. Why? Um, well, formative assessments, depending on how you do it, could be a way to promote active learning. So there's lots of studies saying that if you just lecture at students, they're not absorbing the material and you don't know if they're getting it. That's why some of the prior panelists have talked about things like polling um, and Zoom questions. It actually also increases the use and efficiency of your class time. So if you find out that the students are all getting a particular thing, then it's like, great, we can use class time to do other things. The other nice thing is that it helps promote long-term learning. So I happen to teach a civil procedure, which is a first year class. And then, um, although at the time, some of the students complain it's too much work because there's lots and lots of formative assessments. I do three quizzes a week and hypotheticals. I get a lot of um, random emails when they're studying for the bar. They're like, wow, I still remember all that stuff. And I don't think it's because I did something special. It's because practice works. You just remember it. Like we all probably learned how to ride a bike at one time. So even though it's maybe been years, we still know how to do that. Um, so you might be wondering, well, what could be formative assessment? It might sound official, but I think most people who already um, interact with students in a Socratic dialogue are doing some kind of formative assessment. You are giving them feedback, but there's other things you could do. Here are just some examples. Um, I have objective in quote marks because some people don't like that term, but basically things that arguably have an answer. Um, and then essay-ish things, some kind of written thing. Um, and then there could be something that's short of an essay, such as a discussion board or a comment, or it could even be a response paper someone talked about. And also I've had students do class presentations. So all of these things are things you could give either verbal feedback to the whole class, to some students, written feedback, a variety of different things that I'll talk about. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I get started? Sounds like a lot. Well, you basically get started the same place as with all the other um, things we've been talking about. What are your goals for the class and in the syllabus? Um, so for example, one of my class goals for civil procedure or intellectual property is training students to learn to be able to parse out statutory language instead of having their eyes glaze over. So if I want them to be able to do that on the final, and I do often have statutory language on what I call a mystery statute and short answer questions, I make sure that I have questions during class, like clicker questions, um, and maybe on a practice midterm where they have an opportunity to practice. Um, so think about what you want and how the assessments can promote those goals. And related to that, you might wanna think of how many types, how often do you want it once a week, once a class period, um, in class, outside of class. And another thing to think about is, could you have a series of smaller weight assignments 
build up to an outcome. That's what the series of steps is supposed to be. So for one of my seminar classes, I have like a client report midway through the semester, but I have three smaller assignments before that that are building blocks. So they can get the feedback, whatever they screwed up, they now know how to do it better. Um, and so that builds on things. Another thing that I think is helpful is getting feedback to you on whether your assessments are working. So people have talked a little bit about this. Um, you probably all know that there are final class evaluations and that's kind of nice for teaching a class again, but it doesn't help you course correct in the class now. So I'm personally a big believer in informal mid-semester feedback. And I'm very transparent about the students about this. I'm like, my goal here is to help you. And that's why we do these assessments. I have them in the syllabus. And I also say, I want to see how we can make class better. So um, I have a low tech way of doing it. You can do a, a, like a survey, but I just literally hand out blank index cards. And I say, tell me anything you want to know um, that I could do better. And then I report back the next class. And sometimes I'm like half the class says, you want this, half the class says, why? Because you can't agree, I'm not gonna change anything, but I did read everything and here are some thoughts. And I do find that once I started doing that, students kind of like chilled down a little bit in terms of they were less like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. They're like, okay, we don't all agree. That's just gonna be the way it is. But sometimes they might tell me something useful I hadn't thought of, like you always turn left, not always, but you tend to turn left in terms of questions or something. And maybe that's helpful. Now, in terms of choosing formative assessment, a key thing to think about is not just your goals, but time. There's obviously limited time. Um, some things take less time. So for example, a verbal response to the whole class doesn't take a lot of time to do. And that's why things like clicker questions in class or um, small group projects are helpful. And also minute papers, I don't think people have talked about, but this can again be an informal, just write on an index class index card, what were you most confused about? And then you can respond the next class. Um, there are written responses that take more time, but could free up class time. So you could do a short quiz before class to make sure all the students are on the same page. And the beauty of something like that is that you can reuse those in subsequent years. And the students can also reuse those for practice um, to make sure they have reinforcement of the material. Um, you can also have, and this doesn't necessarily take a lot of time, a sample answer or a rubric for an essay question or a simulated climate pro a client project. And you can also provide individual feedback. Now, this can sound intimidating, but it doesn't need to be. So you could say, I will read up to three, the first three submissions, um, and that would be kind of your sampling of the whole group, what they think. Um, I usually say first three people who haven't you know, submitted before, and that way kind of mixes things up. Um, in terms of creating formative assessments, there are off the shelf things if you teach like maybe a bar class, uh, but also you can do it yourself from prior exams or even class notes. Like, so if students say they're all confused about a certain point, that can be something you use. It could also be inspiration from real life, commercial sources, or even the news. So I've used discussion prompts as things that I saw in the news that I thought were either wrong or just kind of interesting. Um, I thought I'd just show you some random examples to kind of demystify it. Um, there's a lot of things you could do, but like the first thing I've used in seminar classes, um, I just have the students each post, what are the three most important things you think you learned? And in the process of explaining that, sometimes they'll reveal they didn't quite get something. Um, and I don't necessarily have to respond to each one. I can just in class be like, okay, it seems like you all got X but these are the issues we're gonna talk about. And then I gave some other examples that you could use for any class, but I think especially if you're gonna do something before class or during to make sure they got the basics. And what I find is that this can really help pull students out of their shell if they see other people have similarly made the same choice, even if they realize it was wrong, they might volunteer and be like, okay, I got it wrong, but I wanna explain my reasoning so you can help me get to the right place for the right reason. Um, and the last important thing about formative assessment, I think is grading. Um, now in my mind, formative assessment is all about learning. And if you wanna make the students be primed to learn, I think it's important to reduce their anxiety about grading. So for most of my formative assessments, I try to do it only for timely and professional completion. 
And professional just means that if everyone spent 30 minutes on the quiz, you didn't spend 30 seconds. So um, otherwise I would just give them all credit. You can also do check variance, check, check minus. You can do a small percent of the grade. Um, and as I've talked about before, you can also nestle the assignments. So one thing that might be helpful is always to tell, tell them, here's a class average and the standard deviation explaining, as long as you're in standard deviation, you're in a good place. And even if you're not, if it only counted 5%, it can't necessarily hurt you as long as you learn from that. So I just went through a lot, uh, but hopefully that helps get you started in terms of thinking. Um, I think the AALS resource page is fabulous, but I also have um, a couple of blogs I've previously written about a like, little more data or details about how to use formative assessment. Um, there's a link if you want um, more data on why from assessment helps. Um, but hope that was overall useful and obviously I'm happy to answer questions that might come up later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And for everyone, Cynthia, slides will be available in the resources section of the AALS website along with others so we can follow up on some of those links and details. So next up, our grand finale in terms of panelists will be Chris Franklin to talk to us about summative assessments and how even those, I think, start at the very beginning of our class. Thank you so much, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, I've got some slides to share, but as, before I get started with that, I, as I was preparing for this today, I did stop to think, I actually end up speaking a fair number of times in different places. I'm fortunate that people want uh, to invite me to talk about um, law teaching generally, pedagogy, assessment in particular, and I have almost nothing prepared uh, before today on summative assessment, and I was kind of wondering why that was. And the answer, I think, is because formative assessment is where we teach. Summative assessment is solely where we evaluate. It's the least fun part of what we do, right? I mean, the cliche goes that most of us would teach for free, and what they got to pay us to do is great. Uh, and so this is the part where we're actually doing that. What I do want to remind us is that we have to approach it with every bit the same uh, kind of uh, seriousness as everything else that we've heard from everybody else. We want to plan, we want to be, uh, we want to model good professional behavior, and therefore what we really want to do is approach whatever we're doing uh, for, with summative assessment as methodically as we possibly can. So I'm gonna quickly run through, there's a lot of information out there in the world on how to do this, and I have a short period of time, so I'm not gonna to try to cover every part of it, but I'm gonna to try to give a kind of overview of some of the things that I think we typically think about and how it um, Okay, so, wait a minute. I'm I am told that I'm muted, and yet- No, you're good, Chris. I'm you, good? Okay. Yeah, you, so you muted just, it for a moment, you're right back again. All right, it's just the world muting me. Okay. All right, so will I describe um, different types of summative assessments? Obviously, people can combine uh, aspects of these. Uh, final papers are actually ones that I think are probably even more common for adjunct taught courses than full-time faculty courses, because it's not uncommon to do things like uh, projects and clinics or final papers uh, or that kind of thing. I, I, I want to say with oral reports, whether they're individual presentations or group presentations, I believe we need to approach them with every bit the seriousness and the training and preparation for students that we do with final papers. I'm going to say a word about that in just a minute. I do want to explain what I mean by directed essays, because I think that that falls exactly between a final paper and, a, and what we think of as an exam. Uh, and so that, that's my own terminology. I'm not sure it's something that you're going to see out in the wild. But when I'm referring to direct, directed essays, what I really mean is a couple of short, clear questions that pick up on the overall themes of your class, but ones that students might be given and work on for weeks, as opposed to here you've got 24 hours to do this based on the outline that you've created. But essentially, it's a way of assuring coverage and assuring that you are asking about uh, the various things you've covered. So I do want to say about final papers and oral reports, if we expect students to research and write and present orally, I think that we need to be clear about the fact that we need to teach it, not simply assess it. And that's true in every class with every subject. One of the things that we constantly hear from the practicing bar uh, in the academy is students are not leaving law school with enough uh, preparation and experience in their research and writing and oral presentation skills. And part of that is something that we all have an, an ability to do something about. 
which is if we want students to do this, we have to teach it to them. We have to stage it. We have to take seriously things like outlines and, and uh, earlier drafts and comment and research plans. Research plans is a big one because uh, a lot of students after they finish their first year writing course, essentially just go back to using Google and stop researching like lawyers, um, which works for some questions and doesn't work for other questions. So I just wanna put that out there, but I'm gonna primarily focus the rest of this about talking about exams. All right, so the first thing is we have to assess what we actually teach. All of the stuff that the earlier speakers were talking about, about putting together a good, a good syllabus is exactly what allows us to start from that project and say, this is what is essentially the outline for exams. Students should know that they should start with their course syllabi in order to put things together. And ideally, I think a good syllabus not only lists topics and reading assignments and projects, but actually starts doing conceptual groupings. Here are a bunch of units that sort of give broad themes in the class. If you're doing that in your syllabus, well then do that in your exam as well. Make sure that you're hitting things that work in that, uh, you know, in those general areas. Uh, one thing that I do want to point to in the slides is I mentioned major tensions. Major tensions to my mind in every area of law are the irresolvable questions. The ones in which we have competing policy principles that pull in different directions and no one can entirely decide one side is absolutely right and the rest can be dispensed with. Those are always the most complex and most interesting things that our students are learning about in our courses. Include some of that on the exam. It does not mean that every question has to be unsolvable. It does not mean that everything we ask has to be some version of right every possible perspective on this issue. But it does mean that those things have to be addressed and included, as well as including maybe some counterbalancing things in which if you apply the rules to the facts, you get a clear and simple and straightforward response that you simply want students to spell out. All right. Um, now, once you've sort of started from your syllabus, that gives you a sense of broad topics. It might give you even, uh, depending on how your syllabus is organized, some, some sort of mic micro topics. I've given you some ideas on the slides and I believe that the AALS will make these slides available afterwards. So I don't need to read them to you. But the one thing I do wanna say is this is, once you've done that, this is the opportunity to sort of list topics and then put them aside for a second. This is the one time in most lawyers practice, unless we're all gonna be John Grisham in which we get to write fiction. So go start writing some fiction that is generated by those issues and by those uh, major tensions. I must take a step back and say, we wanna edit that fiction uh, in a minute. I don't think that we should write fiction solely for the sake of writing fiction. This is an assessment. It is an opportunity to test the students on specific doctrinal knowledge and skills that they've developed in your class. We don't wanna to get too far in the weeds on this. I have been doing uh, law teaching for more than 25 years and I'm constantly always getting this wrong when I first draft my first problem. And that's why I try to put uh, several weeks into giving me, myself an opportunity to keep coming back to it and editing as I go and adjusting that narrative. So how do you design the question while well, you're starting with a client walks into your office? You're gonna have the broad issues and the minor issues. You, uh, you should decide right at the outset, are you including distractors? Or are you not including distractors? I personally don't tend to include a lot of distractors, which means almost every fact that is in my fact pattern, chances are the students should find some way of using but not just facts, things like if I'm using an adjective, there's a reason. I'm not describing somebody in a particular way just for the sake of giving you a sense of character. I want you to use that sense of character. Now, there are obviously good educational sound reasons for sometimes including information that the student should not use. Ideally, I think that should be the kind of thing that is so salient and so important that you want an, a, a good student response to say, it is not relevant that, and include that fact and mention it and explain analytically why that doesn't change the legal outcome. It shouldn't be put there just for the sake of including flavor. Um, I'll say one other thing about this. I personally, I love pop culture stuff. I use it all the time in class and on slides and in lectures, and I use jokes and I use humor. I don't use any of it on my final exams. I, I, people differ about this and I understand this. I do think that the high stakes pressure on students in taking exams makes them aware when you use pop culture references. If they're familiar with it, they worry about whether they need to bring in what they know from the outside from, from knowing that. If they're not familiar with it, they probably still get that it's a pop culture reference, which makes them worry that they might be missing things. And therefore I do try to avoid those on high stakes final exams, even though I use them in many other ways and other aspects of my own teaching. 
All right. Once you've edited, I did. I mentioned that I spent a couple of weeks writing an exam. That's because I usually do the big first draft first, and then I try to put it aside for a little while. I think you need to come back to it and edit it. I always make significant changes uh, when I go back and read it. One is to sort of, if there are things that are ambiguous in what I've written, I probably didn't see them at the time that I was writing it because all I thought of was what I imagined the story to be. I might see it the second time. I also might have included issues that I, I meant to be a little hard to spot, but were supposed to be there. And when I go back and look at them, like that's a little too hard to spot. The students shouldn't have to read my mind. So now I'm gonna find ways to sort of hint at it and to add it. I also, this is the part, part where I sort of try to consolidate. I think the shorter fact pattern is always better than the longer fact pattern if it, if it includes as much information as you need. And therefore this is the part where I try to take out anything that I already included that was there just for the sake of character or narrative. I love those things, but they have other places in the world, probably not on a high stakes exam. All right, the next thing I do is take a, is go back and take a very close look at the prompt. Prompt is just a, a, what psychometricians use to refer to that part at the very end of the question, maybe at the beginning, but it should probably be at the very end, telling the students what you want them to do. Now, when many of us went to law school, the prompt was either implied or unstated or was the simple one word, discuss. That has really fallen out of favor. I don't think that very many people are using that and, and certainly it's not being treated as state of the art anymore. Um, it is more common now to, to give it, even if you want a general kind of like find every issue you can in this fact pattern to spell that out a little bit more explicitly. It is also possible and it's becoming more common to give more focused questions. You can take a fact pattern that you've written and still have if there's like th roughly three categories of things you want people to talk about. You can include three prompts. My recommendation if you do that is to be really thoughtful about if they're not roughly proportionally equal in terms of weight, importance, and how much time students should spend on it. I think you should give some guideline in the form of points or in the form of recommended amounts of time uh, or a word count if it's a take home uh, paper or something else about giving them a sense of, of how proportional, how they should apportion their attention and time on these various issues. All right. Um, the, the last thing I would say is, you know, make sure that you think about how specific you want to be. You can include issues that are subtly mentioned. If you want to include, for example, I'm going to use torts uh, as an example. What if you want to include a, um, an issue of negligence per se? Well, the most obvious way is to state a statute, give the students the text of the statute, and then have a fact pattern in which someone is violating that statute. Is very clearly uh, testing uh, negligence per se. If you want to include it, but it's not such a key issue, maybe you reference in passing what the statute is, make it fairly clear that chances are it was violated. It's also possible to get to even a third level of kind of distance by, let's say, for example, um, you made a reference in passing to someone driving 52 miles per hour down a residential street. Now, most residential streets, we don't know what the speed limit is, but chances are it's, uh, it's less than 52 miles an hour. It would not be unreasonable for a test, test taker to see that, spot that and say, there is possibly a negligence per se issue here. Just know that under tight time pressure, a lot of people aren't gonna see that. And so that's fine if you've included that as a good for you bonus points, if you see this and we wanna talk about it, it's probably not the way you wanna go about something that is an absolute key and core issue. And so that's what I mean by sort of thinking through, if you really wanna make people address it, either make the facts clear or make the prompt clear that that's what, we, what you want people to address, but that does not have to be the case for each and every single thing that you wanna do. Last thing I wanna talk about, about uh, both the prompts and the characters before I uh, sort of conclude is, be thoughtful about inclusion and about your fact patterns. They should be accessible to absolutely everyone. It is not uncommon to include things that signal, for example, wealth. That can be uncomfort for people who are not familiar with it. Don't use a polo example unless you're sure that everybody in your room uh, has watched a polo match. Um, it's not a bad idea to define things that might be uh, beyond some people's experience and to think about what people's experiences are and are not. Think about the names that you use. It doesn't have to be that everyone is Jennifer and Bill. Um, 
you know, if you want short single syllable names, it can be complicated, but you know what? Mustafa can be a business person and Juanita can be a doctor. You can get overly cute with that, but try to include names that represent your real students. And if you feel like they're too polysyllabic, an easy way to do it is make the first person in the fact pattern's name start with A, the next person start with B, the third next person after that start with C. The students who wanna move quickly or um, will simply use the initials and you never have to worry about it. And you can use whatever names you want and whatever is appropriate. The last thing I wanna talk about is I even saw someone in the chat as Cynthia was speaking, talking about uh, grading. I, I'm not gonna talk about rubrics in depth because that could be an entire two hour uh, presentation on its own. And I do think rubric is a very specific term of art in, in ed theory. You can call something a rubric. I call it a grading sheet if I think it doesn't quite fill into a rubric. But planning how you're going to score as you prepare your assessment is key. This is an absolutely recursive process. You write a fact pattern, you write a rough sense of how you think proportionally the issues lay out, what you expect people to find. You see new stuff as you're developing that. So then you go back and you revise the fact pattern. And then once you revise the fact pattern, you go back and you change the grading sheet. And I've never, ever not done this at least seven, eight times as I go through it. Then I show it to a colleague, have them say off the top of their head what they think are the issues and see if that tracks with what I've done. And then I am 95% done after I finished, uh, and this is taking me a couple of weeks. Very last minute, what do I gotta do? I gotta wait until I see what the students see. Inevitably, your students will highlight things in a little bit different way. They may see things in the fact pattern in ways that you didn't. I think that's fine. That doesn't, it's not always a sign that I've done a bad job of designing an exam question, but it does tell me I might need to adjust in small ways some of the points I allocate to something. If I thought, 75% of my students were going to see an issue and it turns out 20% of them do. I don't want it to be such a disproportionate bonus to those 20% who do. So I'm still going to include it if I think that it was a thing that more students should have seen, but I'm probably going to decrease the amount of points I allocate to it and proportionally increase some points in some other areas that more people hit so that you get a bonus for seeing it, but you're not dead in the water for not. Uh, that's the quick and the dirty on a lot of different things. Um, I will stop my screen sharing and toss it back at this point to Molly. Thanks so much, Chris and Cynthia. We've heard again, I think, a number of tips that really resonate with today's learning objectives about the importance of planning, of mapping your syllabus to your assessments, including your formative assessments and your summative assessments. We've certainly heard about modeling excellence in terms of bringing your top tier professionalism all the way to the finish line, including in how you think about and put out there and finally evaluate your assessments. And we've also heard some about listening to your students. Formative assessments are a key way that we do listen to our students, literally when we ask them questions and also in finding out how well, in fact, they're mastering the material so far. And we wanna close out this part and segue to Q&A by talking a little bit about course assessments. Now, Cynthia mentioned the possibility that course assessments can be formative as well as summative. So many of us distribute to our students mid-semester surveys, I use, a Google survey to collect anonymous feedback from my students in the middle of the semester, in addition to the formal course evaluations at the end of the semester. Um, and so an acknowledgement of the importance of both of those forms of assessment for us, I wanna pose first to our panelists, but then when we open things up, I hope all of you will feel free, those of you who are experienced teachers to offer responses to this. I want to ask, what is the most valuable piece of feedback that you have received from your students over the course of your careers? And I'll remind you of our modes of interaction. Panelists, you can raise your hand so I know that you're ready to offer a response to this question before we open things up to the audience. Um, I will warm up the group by offering my own. I recall from the early time of my teaching, I was very surprised to receive feedback from students that basically the way I interpreted it was, I was being perceived as harsher than I thought I was. I was responding to student commentary with some smart aleck remark that I thought was funny and lighthearted, and it came off as critical to them, which was super informative. 
to me because I was misassessing how I was perceived and I have erred on the side of gentleness and humanity. Uh, some of the themes that we've heard about from our earlier speakers, understanding better than I did at first, how things that seem only a little bit sharp to me can feel in fact quite cutting to students. Okay, I see that's given our panelists time to uh, to come up with some of their top tips that they've received from students. David, please get us started. Um, my favorite is that students uh, said in um, in a legislation class I was teaching statutory interpretation that they had absolutely no idea what my politics were and that that contributed to class discussion. And I, uh, except in the one course where I've been so involved, I can't hide it. Uh, I absolutely try to hide my politics and it really does help. And when I get those, a lot of evaluations with that in it, it's usually in a course with good class discussion. Thanks, David. Philip, you're up next. Um, well, I would say, and it's, it's, the, it's useful, but I haven't solved it yet, but it, it's, it, you know, I have always done what we were talking about, trying to get the students talking, get good discussions. And the comment that I've gotten over time is, you know, it, that's that's wonderful, but you know, I don't know, you know, which of my classmates are saying things that are accurate and which ones are saying things that are not accurate. And I need you to, at some point, kind of give your own view, uh, so that so that I know uh, what what I what I should be taking from the discussion. And so I've become much more conscious of of trying to, uh, you know, not necessarily. Uh, say, okay, A was right and B was wrong, but more uh, kind of uh, put, put some closure on the discussion. The only other thing I'll say is that what we don't assess uh, in our course evaluations, we don't assess the examination because the course evaluation comes in before the examination. So it was really interesting for me to hear, uh, hear the discussion about assessments and realize that I actually don't know too much about, uh, you know, about what my students think about my assessments because it's not something that we ask them to tell us about. Thanks, Philip. Chris, what's your top tip? Slow down. Yeah. Uh, I'm a New Yorker and I speak like a New Yorker. At least I speak to other New Yorkers because that's most of my students as well. Uh, but as a general matter, I have never observed another faculty member and not thought that they should speak more slowly. I have never had another faculty member observe my teaching and not suggest that I should speak more slowly. No matter how comfortable we get with silence and waiting, for more students to volunteer. We're never comfortable enough and we're always moving too fast. And so it is a universal truth, I think, that we need to slow down and be more comfortable pausing and giving students time and space. Excellent, thanks, Chris. I see lots of nodding that resonates with a lot of our panelists. Mushtaq, go ahead. You know, I, um, I try to find one thing to work on every semester, you know, from the, uh, you know, I get all sorts of feedback, but I try to focus on one thing. And uh, Philip, one semester it was for me trying to be a little bit more direct and sort of figuring out, telling the class what the right answer was after a little bit of discussion. But this semester, it is going to be about sticking to the syllabus and not falling behind. Because um, if there's one thing that my students seem to really not like, it's when we get a little bit off course, especially because I use a panel system where you know half the class is on call one day and the other half is on call the next and if we get off they get thrown off so. thanks much as a former associate dean who's read lots piles of other people's course evaluations as well as my own i can attest that that is a common complaint andrea how about you um i got feedback early on that i was letting certain students um i don't like the term gunner but you know that's was used uh, just asked too many questions that got us down rabbit holes um, and it sucked up class time. And so, uh, and I was, and so I, now I, you know, I ask burning clarifying questions. I realize I don't have to call on you just because your hand is raised. Sometimes I might wink and say, give me a sec. Um, and I'll also say, you know, I'm, I'm so excited they're asking, but I'll say, Great question. Send me an email to remind me about that, but um, we'll talk about it later in the course or it's a more complex issue. And then I deal, sometimes I answer those types of questions in an email to the class about like kind of like fun optional stuff and so that I'm not taking class time. 
Excellent. Thanks, Andrea. Bert, how about you? Hi, so mine follows up uh, a bit on, um, on Phillips and on something much talk said, uh, which is that the students, uh, this is very recent feedback, in fact, really like takeaways. They want to know what the takeaway is. It's not a word that I have ever been drawn to myself. Um, I like to think of the classroom as, you know, discursive, as there's no right answer, because we're always talking in the gray areas. But even when we're doing that, there's no excuse for not making that the takeaway, right? That this is the gray area. And you're, you know, we're working out how to make arguments and, and so on. So I'm going to be adopting Andrea's uh, uh, takeaways ideas. I agree with that, Bert, and I will also say, again, combining Philip and Andrea's insights with yours, the day after takeaways are often a great opportunity to distill what students said into concrete, correct things and help the students pick out from maybe a mass of relatively unformed thoughts what the really important, correct messages are. Uh, Cynthia, go ahead. So I kind of had a similar comment from students as Chris about um, talking too fast, maybe because I lived in New York for a while, but also just going too fast in general. Um, and then some students were like, there's no way we could get all this information. You have all these slides and they go really fast. And they're like, can't you share your slides? And initially I was resistant. I was thinking they weren't going to focus and they were going to skip ahead. But I'm like, I'm going to try it. If you guys focus, it'll, you know, I'm willing to do it. And contrary to my assumption, it worked out and they found it was easier to take notes. And I was just like, oh, my hesitation was just off base. So I'm glad they told me and, and it all worked out. That has been my experience as well. Thank you, Cynthia. So next we're gonna hear from Urshka and then Barbara, and then we're gonna open things up to the audience for more of your top tips from experienced instructors or burning questions that you still have uh, for our group. I want to acknowledge that we're not going to have time for everything. I want to really thank people who've been posing questions in the chat. And many of you who are experienced instructors have been answering questions in the chat. So we've done a lot of collaborative learning there already. And, uh, and I hope we find opportunities to connect in the future to keep those conversations going. Okay, Urshka, what's your tip? So students often get confused in the middle of the semester where it's beginning, how do things fit together? They come to off asking questions. So I've started using this if you'll allow me to share my slides. I actually have slides giving them basically the syllabus with highlighting, this is where we are so they know what, what the order is of which I'm doing and what, and I'll explain to them there's a reason why I'm doing things in this order. So that stops them from asking questions that are jump ahead. It's sort of like, we'll get to that. And they can see it from the beginning of the semester. This is in response to some early feedback I got. I'm confused where we are. It's all interesting and fun, but how do things fit together? Once I started doing this, all of that stopped. And the feedback I'll typically get, this class is so structured, even though this is probably the only thing I changed. <laughs> Fantastic. Students do appreciate a roadmap. And we've talked already several times today about how important it is for you to build one and it's helpful for you to reveal it. Go ahead, Barbara. Very early in my career when I was one of uh, only a couple women faculty members at the school I was teaching at, I had a group of young women come to me and say, you need to wear makeup and, and do your hair because you're presenting a model to us of what a, a lawyer, you know, you're our model for, for what a lawyer is and you don't look like a lawyer to us. And while I didn't take their advice, the, the perspective that they were watching me and they were learning from me what it means to be a lawyer, that I'm teaching that in every class in addition to whatever subject I am teaching, uh, is a lesson that has stuck with me for the 30 many years since uh, that time. And it, being more deliberate about thinking, how am I modeling what it means to be a lawyer in the classroom? Those, those lessons that go across substantive uh, boundaries. Barbara, I love the takeaway of that, I'm glad the takeaway isn't wear makeup because that is not my personal style either. But I also want to observe something extra about what you just said, which is that you learned something really valuable from that evaluation, even though you didn't take the student's advice. 
And I want to say that there are many opportunities where you learn from the evaluations that you're not explaining enough why you are cold calling on students, for example, if they have the impression that it's to humiliate them and not to give them the opportunity to practice their oral advocacy skills in an inclusive environment. And so often we can make, as you've just suggested, adjustments in response to our evaluations, even though they aren't giving the students exactly what they ask for. We can learn so much that helps us improve our teaching. Well, it's time to open things up for our few remaining minutes, and I see we have at least one hand raised already. I hope we get more queued up, and I will recognize people in turn, and Alexa is going to make sure that you are unmuted. And Peter Fendel, you are our first speaker. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, your time and assistance. This has been extremely valuable, greatly appreciated. Um, I just finished my first year teaching at Pepperdine Law School, and a uh, question that I'm really struggling with, something that I continually am trying to figure out, um, is this balance that was sort of mentioned in the beginning, but I don't know that we got into it too much, of try, not necessarily catering to everyone, but you know, focusing on students that are struggling without alienating our smartest and our stars. Um, that balance has been very challenging for me. I feel like when I... I I'm always going too far. If I'm talking to the students that are struggling, I'm losing the students that are at the top of their class. They just feel like their time is being wasted and then vice versa. Um, and I was wondering any sort of tips that anyone is willing to share in that regard. I know it's not necessarily an answerable question, but uh, advice is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Great question, Peter. I've struggled with that myself. And so I'm hoping that one of our panelists wants to volunteer to give a thoughtful answer about what might have worked for them in the past. I'm sitting with the uncomfortable silence. Andrea, Andrea, please go ahead. I'll just say one thing I do is um, I'll, if there's something, a point that I make that if they don't understand it, they're very, very far behind. I will say, if that was hard for you, or if you got, if, if you answered A, um, come see me in office hours, you know, and we'll, we'll do the, say the same thing 10 different ways until it clicks. And so I'm, I'm, I'm flagging for them Look, I'm moving on, but uh, it's not like like you must come see me if 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 you answer day or whatever. Fantastic, thanks, Andrea. I see we have a couple of other volunteers, but in the people, in the interest of hearing from people that we haven't heard from before, I want to recognize Denise out there in the audience who has her hand raised. Go ahead, Denise. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Denise Hartsfield. I am an adjunct professor at Wake Forest University School of Law in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, I also am a 20-year district court judge in the same city that Wake Forest is in. And I was listening to the comments about war stories. And I think I put in the chat that um, I'm teaching juvenile law in North Carolina uh, this fall. And because of what I have done for so long, my repertoire is full of stories. Call them war, call them love, call them whatever. Um, so I just want to kind of get a feel of, you know, why probably I've heard so much about no war stories and are some classes more geared to war stories than others? Excellent, Denise. I too heard, I think, a couple different perspectives on this topic from our panelists. I think people have different styles and bring different strengths to their teaching. And it's important to tie your stories to the points that you are trying to drive home. I think that was part of what Andrea was emphasizing. Chris, do you have something on this point? I do, which is that I think the class, when people say uh, that they did this favor war stories, it's because the classroom should not be about us. It should be about our students learning. But part of what our students are learning about is real world practice experience. It's what really actually happens. And to the extent that that's what you're talking about, how can that, how can your wealth of experience on the bench not possibly be an advantage for your students to hear about? That's not the same thing as self aggrandizing moments of like, here's this cool thing I did once. And I think that's the distinction that people mean when they're talking about war stories versus real life experiences that are helpful to helping students comprehend the material. Thank you very much. I see another judge up there that's nodding his head. Hey, your judge <laughs> practitioners who coming into the law situation is kind of different. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
Yeah, let's hear more wisdom from the bench. Judge Matt Williams, go ahead. <laughs> so I've been teaching now trial advocacy now for 30 years. Um, and, you know, the problem with war stories where you're the hero is it becomes about you and it becomes about how wonderful you are. And it's not about the teaching moment, the learning moment. The great thing about war stories where, you know, candidly you messed up and you learn something is that's the real life um, experience because then they can learn from your mistakes. Um, there was actually something that, um, uh, Ms. Brown had posted about discussion boards that I was hoping to make a brief comment about, if I may. Um, and because she was saying, how do you base, how do you use discussion boards or how do you best do that? And about, especially during pandemic, and trust me, transitioning a trial advocacy course into a fully remote environment where you have to teach both in-person and remote advocacy created some challenges these last couple of years. Um, but one of the, 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 the gifts was Canvas and the use of discussion boards. And one of the things that I and my teaching colleague did was we set up a discussion board that we monitored that, and that we contributed to, but we required our students to post each week the concept that they were struggling with the most. And then we required each student to not only post, but then reply to somebody else's. And then we chimed in as well. And again, provided that, because my, my, my teaching colleague is also a judge, provided real life experiences and analysis based upon the challenge that they were uh, facing, some of, the, some of the challenges that we had faced. And then we're, we were able to not only monitor the things that the students were struggling with, but also we were able to see them help each other and at the same time guide the discussions. So. Just wanted to throw that out for Ms. Brown. Fantastic. Thanks, Judge. I want to apologize to those who still have their hands raised and the questions in the chat that we have not answered, but I want to model professionalism by trying to wrap up this session more or less on time, which I think your students also really appreciate starting and stopping on time. So I'm going to aim for that, but I don't want to shortchange Reflecting just briefly on our planned learning outcomes and also thanking a bunch of people for their contributions to this session. So we hope that by now you have a new or refreshed appreciation for the importance of planning to course design, delivery, and assessment. We hope you've learned new ways to think about your students, all of them, including the stars and the stragglers. Thanks to Peter for the question uh, that made us reflect on that some more. And we hope that you feel encouraged to model excellence for your students as Barbara emphasized and also to model humanity and fun. I think that was a recurring theme of everything that we heard for today. And who brought the fun? Let me thank all the folks who helped to bring the fun for today. Well, first off, all of you, we did have a lot of great input, both questions and answers in the chat. So thank you for bringing that collaborative spirit there and to all of you for devoting your time to attending today. I want to especially thank the planning committee. You heard from Philip, and Ershka, you also heard from Barbara glessner finds a key member of our planning committee who put together the resource page that you will find from the AALS page on our new resources for adjunct faculty. I wanna thank the leadership of AALS, Erwin and Judy. Erwin, I think, came up with the idea of having a session like this for the first time and the great attendance and participation we've had, I think really demonstrates the value of that idea. And Judy and her team made sure that it happened. That includes Mary Cullen, Associate Director of Meetings, Jim Grief, the Director of Communications, Alexa Maltby, of member services and product project management and Kara McQuitty, the associate director for a membership review. They're gonna make sure that this session's video gets edited and posted as soon as that is possible. So if you want to review any of it or pass along to your colleagues that it might be something useful to them, I hope that you will do that. Um, I'm gonna pause in case any of my colleagues want to remind me of anything that I'm forgetting before we adjourn. I don't see anything. So with that, again, thanks to all of you for attending. Best wishes for a well-planned and empathetic and excellent and fun semester with your students. Take care, everyone.